Hello everybody, welcome to my talk about epistemic indulgence, freedoms and liberties of learning music in online environments. This is actually the presentation of a research project that I've been conducting recently and was published in the Australian Journal of Music Education. So I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Adelaide in the unit of Digital Learning and Society. Uh, this project was an autho-ethnographic project looking into how people teach themselves music online using online resources, particularly around YouTube and music communities, with a specific focus on people that teach themselves how to play the guitar. As I'm presenting a research paper, I'll be giving you some background and some discussion on the literature before getting into the data findings, discussion and conclusion. So to start with, um, I'm sure you're all aware, if you're watching this on YouTube, you must be aware that uh, there has been a dramatic increase of technology, particularly in communications technology. And we've moved in general from analog to digital technologies in all sorts of facets, um, particularly in communication. And that's been referred to as the digital age. Uh, a quick quote from Ross and Hedstrom, they say the digital environment is fundamentally reshaping how society produces, disseminates, uses and repurposes information and knowledge. This is an epistemological issue. Epistemology is how we know the things that we know. In this paper you'll see that I've overlapped it with pedagogy, how we learn things. So epistemology is more about how we can know things and pedagogy is about how we get to know things. There's plenty of literature out there talking about how in the 21st century, in the modern digital age, people have completely transformed how we listen to music, how we find new music, how we share music with each other, how we purchase music, how we store music. People don't really have bookshelves of vinyl anymore. Well, some people do, but generally we store music in digital formats on hard drives or not even that. Sometimes we just don't even store music, we just access clouds. And of course the digital age has had a dramatic effect on how we learn things, modes of delivery and how we store knowledge. So those two things come together and therefore the education of music has also had dramatic changes since the birth of the digital age. As I said earlier, my study is focusing particularly on the guitar, so we have to do a bit of a background to understand just exactly what the guitar is and its history, its the background of its pedagogy and epistemology. So the thing that we now call a guitar has evolved out of a family of instruments that were developed over hundreds if not thousands of years particularly in Eastern Europe, and they then moved, migrated, uh, particularly into Spain. So when the Spanish brought the oud into Spain and that sort of evolved into the guitar. This is obviously an extremely brief overview of the history of guitar with almost no detail, it's just to give you some background. Obviously, there's lots of books and other places where you can find a much more detailed history of the guitar and its journey and its pedagogy. From Spain, the guitar sort of uh, migrated through into the rest of Europe. In Central Europe, it particularly uh, migrated into Italy. And by the 16th century, there was already a well-established repertoire. So as a result of this migratory background. Uh, there's been two typical modes of learning to teach the guitar, learning to play the guitar through teaching. Uh, one is what we would recognize as just by communities of people getting together and jamming. Uh, that's a fairly common method in popular music these days. And the other is by formal education through a mentor. Uh, so the first one we would describe as the communities of practice and those that are familiar with Wenger's work, that's how he describes it. The community model was particularly predominant in Spain and the modern form of the guitar uh, evolved particularly in Spain. And they were often 
particularly around southern Spain, Andalusia, and up to in the, the west there towards Valencia, there were each village pretty much had its own uh, luthier, a little guitar builder, and he worked in his workshop, and that was often the centre of the community, and. Uh, Often on weekends and Friday evenings, the communities would come around to these workshops and they'd have parties and sing and play music and dance. And there was this whole culture that sort of evolved over hundreds of years in Spain around the, yeah, the Luthiers workshops. And of course, the other model, the apprentice model, was much more predominant in uh, Eastern Europe, in Italy and in Venice and those sort of places. Uh, where the guitar took a while to become an established instrument, but by the 17th century, um, yeah, it did have a formal pedagogy. And you can see in this picture here, painted in the 17th century, that there's a, a little book of sheet music down by the Tudor's left foot. Um, so, yeah, we, we can see from that picture that there was written music, a written repertoire for the guitar uh, in the 1600s. Again, some more serious overgeneralizing here, but in general, the community model was an oral tradition where the skills were just passed down by word of mouth, and the apprentice model was mostly a written tradition. However, as I said, this is obviously super generalized and super brief. Um, there was no boundaries, and these traditions overlapped. There's often communities of guitar players learning through the oral tradition in places where the apprentice model existed and vice versa. Now, as the Europeans, particularly the Spanish and Portuguese, migrated particularly over to the Americas, but also other parts of the world, they took the guitar and its music with them. Fast forward to the 20th century and lots of technological progress happened, which had a dramatic influence on the guitar. Obviously, electricity was a big thing. Um, faster international travel and communication caused the guitar to become a truly uh, international, a truly global instrument. Those of you that are familiar with popular music guitar pedagogy, you would already be familiar, I assume, with Lucy Green's work. If you're not, then I highly recommend reading this book and all of her other work. So the, the guitar was predominant in the popular music styles, rock and roll and all of its derivatives. And the way that rock and roll was learnt and taught had its very own particular, again, the community model sort of thing going on with people just getting together and jamming. And of course, this was predict particularly predominant in uh, America and the UK and popular forms of music that evolved in those two countries. So there was a strong mix of informal learning styles where people taught themselves, people taught each other in groups, and they just learnt from books and transcribing recordings. And of course, Mel Bay's Modern Guitar Method is one of the books that was quite predominant in that era. So as I've said, communities have been a strong presence in the history of the guitar. Wherever guitars have gathered, there's always been that community attitude of sharing. Sometimes it's been a quite competitive attitude as well. See if you know, people get together and see if they can sort of outplay each other and outdo each other. But guitarists have often gathered and talked about all sorts of things, and not just the music, but also the instruments and you know the gauge of strings and the gauge of picks and their influences and all that sort of thing. Now, of course, uh, with technological developments in communications and the, the, the nature of the communities changed. New communities and even new types of communities have now developed that exist online. When I did a Google search, a Google image search and typed in guitar community, this is one of the pictures that came up. Someone sitting in a room by themselves with a computer. That's that's a real picture of a guitar community in the 21st century. Now, of course, all of this has epistemological implications. How we know things can depend on how we share things and how we find things out. And the platform by which we share things and the platform by which we search for information 
affects the information itself, how it can be stored, how it can be shared, what it looks like, all those sorts of things actually really matter. Uh, a brief side note, uh, in the early days of the internet where guitar communities formed via email forums and news groups and those sorts of things, uh, and then the peer-to-peer -peer file sharing sites, I'm sure you can remember them all if you're familiar with this, um, you know, the history of this story. Uh, one of the big issues that happened, of course, was there was very little understanding of copyright laws. There were, and in fact still are, no universal global copyright laws, uh, which have caused quite a number of problems. And yeah, that's still an ongoing issue. And of course, with the advent of artificial intelligence, that's been ramped up to another whole level. So in those earliest days when people were trying to share knowledge via email, um, they weren't, th these early days people didn't really have scanners at home, didn't have smartphones where they could take photos, sharing visual images online wasn't really possible or at least not easy and not accessible to the average person. So yeah, things were generally shared by email and therefore word processors were the things, was the the tool, I guess, that was used to produce the information. So they had to come up with ways of sharing musical information via a word processor. So uh, there was a lot of toing and froing and back and forth in between different members of the communities and different communities themselves as to exactly the formats and the styles that would be used to share information. For example, when strumming chords or chord voicings. People couldn't do chord diagrams and couldn't do music notation or uh, even rhythmic notation using pictures and diagrams. So they had to come up with ways of doing it with a word processor. And here's a couple of really early examples. So on the left there, it's just a strumming pattern. It doesn't tell you what chords to play or anything. Uh, it's a really common strumming pattern, that particular one. And that's all been generated just with a word processor. And on, on the right is just a list of chords that were to be used in a song. And you can see the, the format that they've used. They've got the, the, the list of the actual chords followed by the fret numbers for each string. And across the top there is just the, the labels for each string. And this particular person obviously didn't put much effort into lining up the strings with the labels at the top. So it looks all a bit higgledy-piggledy. Uh, if you're familiar with the system, you can understand this quite easily. If you're not familiar with the system, it can cause a bit of confusion and frustration and lots of people had no idea what was going on. And of course, tablature. Now, tablature has actually been around for hundreds of years. It wasn't new, it wasn't birthed for the internet, but it was certainly given a rebirth by the internet. So a lot of these early email and peer-to-peer -peer file sharing sites, and in fact, it's still going on now, of course, uh, people were sharing their music via tablature. Uh, so tablature is just a form of notation exclusive to the guitar, well, it's <laughs> exclusive to each particular instrument, each particular form of tablature. Uh, so the lines represent each string and the numbers just tell you which fret to play. So that there, that's actually just a C major scale, the first couple of bars, and then the next section is just actually the opening riff to La Bamba. So the first thing they had to decide on was which font to use, and Courier New was the one that was sort of widely accepted. Uh, an issue with tablature, of course, is the notation of rhythm. It was it, There was no system in the simple tablature to indicate how long to play each note. And a few different systems sort of evolved, and people have tried various methods. And there's two examples there. That first one, I really... I just don't understand that. I, maybe somebody out there in YouTube world can send me a message or type something in the in the comments below. What is going on there? I'm not sure. The bottom one, they've got letters across the top to indicate whether it's the half note or an eighth note or a quarter note to indicate how long to play the note for. Eventually, after <laughs> decades really, um, some symbols and some protocols started to evolve and started to develop and this is one that's from a reasonably recent upload to a guitar tab website um, which sort of gives a summary of the kind of symbols that you would expect to see 
Um, so these become fairly standardized um, but just simply by frequency of use by the members of the community. So as a result, we've seen a form of language evolve through these online communities. And of course, language is the foundation of knowledge and therefore it's a important factor of epistemology. Uh, this concept of community members developing their own language, their own symbolisms is often referred to, or in this case, it's a form of folksonomy. So this community-based uh, language, this community-based folksonomy, is in fact a type of epistemic resonance. We're going to talk about epistemic resonance again in a few minutes. So in more recent years, the most prominent platform for guitar communities has been YouTube. And YouTube has, as explained here by Spillane, has become the go-to platform for not just guitar communities, but lots of online guitar communities. And not just communities, just online learning. If, like, if you've broken your phone screen and you want to learn how to replace it, you can just go to YouTube and learn how to do it. Buy the parts and follow the instructions and, hey presto, you've learnt something. So yeah, YouTube <laughs> has transformed. Uh, knowledge sharing. Other community spaces that are typical or common for the guitar community, of, of course, include Instagram. Facebook is another really big one. Uh, it's even though people say Facebook is dead, it's actually still a really strong uh, presence for guitar communities. And of course, uh, Twitter or whatever it's called nowadays. In their study exploring the concept of online music piracy and the epistemological implications of what's going on there, Davies and colleagues uncovered what they call epistemological dissonance. And we'll talk more about epistemological dissonance again in a minute or two. Now, the ultimate focus of my research, this paper, this publication and this presentation is the concept of, and the term that I've coined here, epistemic indulgence. Self-guided learners using online resources to teach themselves have the freedom to learn whatever they choose, in whatever order, so there's no curriculum, there's no scaffolding, using whatever resources they find best suits them and their whims. To put it more succinctly, you are free to chart your musical journey on your own terms. So, for example, a guitarist or someone that wants to learn to play the guitar may choose a particular song that they want to learn or a particular goal and they go on Facebook or YouTube and find a resource to teach them that song and they just learn the content of the song, how they have to, what they have to play to be able to play that song. They might not know or even understand that really there should have been some learning of the scales or learning of the theory behind the harmony, the chord structure, etc. All sorts of things that in traditional learning modes we would sort of build up towards particular goals and have steps in each way. So yeah, the concept of epistemic indulgence is where someone just bypasses all of that and just chooses what it is they want to learn and just go about learning it however fits them. So this is obviously in stark contrast to the other method of learning that we talked about earlier, particularly in the apprentice model, uh, the epistemic inertia, where what you learn and how you learn it is built on what's happened in the past, how your teacher learnt and what they learnt, how their teacher learnt and what they learnt, how the dominant uh, institutional education uh, teaches things, right? There's all this process of teaching and pedagogy and learning which creates a sense of epistemic inertia. However, as we saw before um, with Lucy Green's work but also Rupert Till's work is that this particular uh, institutional mode of music learning uh, doesn't actually fit with how popular musicians typically learn, the informal learning style. And it's created this sort of dissonance 
that you know popular music is a fringe activity it's it's not real music etc etc and the yeah there's <laughs> the serious musicians and popular musicians and never the twain shall meet kind of thing however in the community model there's this thing called epistemic resonance where you find out about your music by resonating with other people in your community another example of this is how people share music people will often get together and say hey i found this new song the other day do you want to have a listen to it and they share their music with each other so person a has an influence on person b's musical taste but it's not just their musical taste it, it's deeper than that it's also their musical epistemology is actually influenced by the people around them so people learning in these communities have this thing that we call epistemic resonance and this actually introduces an interesting equity of access to information issue uh, that the institutionalized music programs often uh, without without deliberately setting up this you know, problem of access uh, if you were a popular musician and you wanted to do formal education in an institution then you probably had to in the early days uh, had to go and learn classical music or maybe jazz um, it's only been recently that higher education has sort of uh, embraced popular music and particularly recently embraced the informal learning styles and methods that are used in popular music um, so yeah that's broken down a bit of an equity of access issue a good example of epistemic indulgence was found in a study where they realized that uh, less than a third of people in these online music communities could actually read music notation um, <laughs> even though most of them claimed they were that could compose music so they were songwriters singer songwriters that could create new music but didn't know how to write it down However, there is an overlap between epistemic inertia and epistemic resonance, because when you're learning in a institution, you're probably going to be in a community of other learners as well. And so the other people in the student cohort, but, but also the community does involve the teachers, the educators, maybe even the course designers. Um, so yeah, there can be um, both epistemic and inertia and epistemic resonance happening at the same time. Um, not just in institutionalized education this can happen in communities it can also happen in you know, those informal popular music learning like um, informal music schools and the community music groups those sorts of things uh, can have these two things happening together as as a bit of an overlap the self-guided learners who are teaching themselves at home using online resources obviously are engaging with epistemic indulgence but they're also interacting with the people in the community that create the music that or create the resources that they're learning from you know the, the youtube creators the other people in their facebook communities etc so even though they do have maximal epistemic indulgence they also are overlapping with resonance with the other people that they're learning with and these people most of the people that are learning music online also do you know share what they've learnt and get together with other people friends and have jam sessions and all that sort of thing so these two things also do overlap ultimately someone that's learning music at home by themselves self-directed learning mode using online resources would do a lot better if they did have the underlying knowledge of what it is to know things what it is to learn things so epistemology and pedagogy and they could develop their own autonomous learning journey and they would do a lot better at that if they understood learning if they understood the process of learning and of course these concepts can be taught and why not in a institution teach people those skills so that they then can create they can have the independent thinking they can have the critical thinking they can self-manage their own learning but still within the framework of the curricula 
and the guidelines, I guess the guiding of an institution or a mentor, or I like to, to use the word a concierge. So a, a music educator in the 21st century, rather than being the person that imparts knowledge, imparts onto the student where the student can uh, best access the knowledge that they're looking for. And another interesting point is the, the platform and the equipment and the technology being used actually also influences how the student goes about learning things. If you're um, a self-guided learner working at home using YouTube, then obviously the, the mode of learning is directed by that platform. If you're learning via uh, video exchange or if you're learning via Zoom, or however else you're you know, interacting with people in your community, that technology also influences your epistemology and your pedagogy. It actually influences what it is you can learn and how you can learn and how you can know things. So online learning in a self-guided autonomous manner uh, does give a lot of freedom to the learner. It allows for maximal epistemological indulgence so that a student can absolutely choose just exactly what it is they want to learn. Obviously they can't, well there's no curriculum goals or curriculum outcomes to meet so it's very difficult to uh, assess a student that's been using that learning method um, but you know is assessment even a thing that we're worried about in this particular instance. It's very difficult, very difficult to compare uh, one guitar player to another, and should we even be doing that in in the arts, not just in music, but yeah, you know, not just performing arts, but the arts in general. So yeah, these are all very deep questions that uh, involve uh, things like epistemology and autonomy and all those sorts of questions and topics. Which leads me to another concept, and that's the concept of epistemic discretion. So wherever you are in the chart, whether you're a self-directed learner, whether you're a student at a institution, whether you're learning through a community, or possibly all three of those all at the same time, which is actually probably the most common model, um, you as the learner have to have a little bit of discretion about what it is you're learning, how you're learning it, why you're learning it. Um, it an educator at your institution might tell you that you have to do this. That might not actually meet with your personal goals. So maybe you just learn a little bit just to please your teacher or to pass an exam, but it's not actually where you want to go. So you spend a bit more time perhaps over here on the right side of this chart doing what it is you want to do. But if you've got enough discretion, then you can understand just exactly how to maximize your learning through those three different uh, epistemic, uh, what would you call them, categories. Epistemic inertia, epistemic resonance, and epistemic indulgence. So to conclude, we've seen really vast, fast uh, developments in telecommunications, which has completely overturned all sorts of things, not least the music industry, but also the education industry, and of course, those two things together. So of course, this all has enormous and deep complex implications on how we know what we know and do we know the, the boundaries of whether what we know is correct or incorrect music theory, for example. So I've seen a lot of things happening in online music communities where people are expressing, particularly uh, in guitar circles, it's often how chords work, what chords are, those sort of concepts. People in uh, like the informal, self-taught, popular music idiom will often have very different concepts of how chords work and why they do what they do from people that have been formally trained through the institutions. Which one's correct? Which one's not correct? Is, there, is that even a, a category to call things correct or incorrect? So yeah, the, the, the whole concept of knowledge has had to you know, dramatically adjust itself to how we impart knowledge, how we imply things through 21st century communication, particularly in music and particularly in guitar learning 
and part of it all comes down to, as I said before, the, the platforms that are being used, the technology that's being used, even you know the, the choice of font that's being used for communicating tablature. These things all have epistemological um, implications. So the kind of discussions that happen in online communities, particularly of guitar learners, um, can be described as epistemic resonance, as people share music, share what they know, share how they know what they know. However, there's also a bit of dissonance between that and the previous understanding of what music is and the boundaries of musical theory and formal and informal learning. And also, of course, the legal implications of online resources. And of course, my discussion focused on epistemic indulgence. Self-directed learners do have great freedom and access to knowledge um, these days in the 21st century with modern communications. However, this does come at various expenses, um, particularly in understanding the uh, pre-existing concepts of what is or is not the boundaries of how music works or what is correct or not correct music, all those sorts of questions. And this requires epistemic discretion for a self-directed learner to, ex you know, to experience their maximal possible learning potential. And another little feature of my research was um, the notion that the communication that has evolved through these online communities is a form of folksonomy, which itself is a product of epistemic resonance. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments section below. Thank you.